When those little purple bars make it to the sides, that's when I know the time is to say hello. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Ohio Has Issues. You know what time it is. It's time to talk Ohio politics with your friends, Mike and Stephanie. Welcome back. Mm -hmm. Now, Ohio Has Issues, in case you are just finding us for the first time, welcome. Where have you been? But we, uh, we talk Ohio politics leading all the way up to this very important November election where we are going to be deciding, we could very well be deciding the balance of the Senate here in Ohio. That's true. The Ohio Senate race has been determined to be one of the most potentially pivotal in the country. One of the two. It's him and Johnny Tester in Montana is trying to hang on in a, in a Trump one state as well. So the, the, those are the two probably most gettable Democratic seats right now. And we have one right here in Ohio in case you haven't noticed from the advertising that you're going to be seeing incessantly <laughs> leading up until November. So it's going to get very competitive around here and we're trying to keep you up to date as uh, we get closer to November. If you haven't noticed yet, boy, will you. Yes. Just yes. hang on. So we got a uh, solid show lined up for you today. We're going to be talking with something we're going to do for you every week when there's important and relevant things to share. We're going to give you a rundown of what's going on with that big Senate race. Sure. I'll give you an update on the Senate race. And then we're going to talk about one uh, issue that caught our eye this past couple or over the last week. And uh, we're going to focus in on it a little bit. I mentioned this to Stephanie that this was something it was something that we've both been aware of. It's school funding. It's, it's the, uh, the, the way that we're funding schools here in Ohio because some numbers came out that are pretty jarring over the last few weeks that we wanted to share with you. And we're going to discuss it and get, in, uh, get into detail. And I mentioned to Stephanie, I said, this is pretty important. It seems like something that we should just maybe focus on for the folks. And uh, boy, she went, she went and ahead and took care of that. She booked every <laughs> expert. We are, you are going to learn about school funding here in Ohio, thanks to Stephanie Haney, because she doesn't do things 50%. She's 140 Five percent at least all the time. So all kinds of people are going to be speaking to us. Who, do, who are we going to be talking to? That's true. Yes, we are going to be talking with Laura Hancock. Mm -hmm. Of course, Laura Hancock from Cleveland.com. Uh, she's a great political reporter, and she's it's her work that really uh, caught my eye and it triggered really this whole thing. So we're going to go right to the source and talk to her. And she's going to set the table for us. Yeah, she's done some incredible reporting on the school voucher program, the Ed Choice voucher program specifically, and how it's expanded in Ohio. And as uh, you may have guessed, some people are for it. Mm -hmm. And others are not so much for it. Mm -hmm. And so, we're going to talk to both sides on that. Yes, we are. We're going to talk with the CEO of School Choice Ohio. His name is Eric Yitz Frank. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk to him about what he thinks about the program and why he's for kind of the buzzword that's been associated with this. And is also, school choice. yes, and also why the middle name Yitz. That's his middle name. We want to find out about that, too. Yeah, we mm -hmm. will let you know about that. I asked him about that ahead of the interview. I'll mm -hmm. share that with you after the conversation. Who else do we have on? We also have the executive director of Vouchers Hurt Ohio. Mm. So you can probably That's guess what side of the aisle that person's on. Right. And then we're also going to be talking to a Case Western law professor that is Dr. Daniel Jaffe. And he's going to be giving us his legal perspective on what, th what they're doing in Ohio and whether or not it's even legal. Now. Don't fall asleep yet, but it does have to do with constitutional law. Sorry, and guys. it is interesting. And we will get the information to you quickly, and you will understand it, and you will be better informed. He sells it, believe me. Dr. Jaffe, really, off Listen, the chain. Listen, trust me, constitutional law was my least favorite class in law school, but it's important, and we get through it pretty quick, so you'll have a better understanding when this is all over. Does everyone know Stephanie's a lawyer? <laughs> Did I mention that mm -hmm. I'm a lawyer? Um, so we are going to touch on that one important issue, but first, we got to tell you a little bit about what's going on and update you on the Senate race. What are what are the uh, gentlemen up to, uh, Senator um, Brown and Marino? Yeah, so we'll start with Senator Brown. He was in Ohio this week. On Monday, he was in town. He visited with Ohio union workers, and he was there with them to celebrate the fact that they have access to pensions. Mm -hmm. So he gave a little bit of a speech at that event this week, which was on Monday. So let's hear that now, a little bit of it. That's what we got got to continue to push, you know, whether it's wages, whether it's collective bargaining. One of the things, I've known this a long time, but one of the things a lot of people learned during this fight for these pensions was how collective bargaining works. Because frankly, I don't think people understand collective bargaining. They don't understand that you give up wages today so that you've got security for your family, health security and retirement security. And that's why, that's why I fought like hell for this. And as Bill said, Wall Street was the only winner of this pension issue until we won. And again, it wouldn't happen without so many of you, Butch Lewis, and so many of you stepping up the way you did. So thank you again for that. At long now the Senator's team told us the Butch Lewis Act, which Senator Brown introduced 
in Congress has saved the pensions of over 100,000 Ohioans. And as he mentioned there, Brown did name the bill after an Ohio teamster, Butch Lewis. And they said that Ohio workers, here's a comment from the campaign, we just want to share that with you. Ohio workers know that Sherrod will always stand up to special interests to fight for Ohioans and the dignity of work. Again, that's a quote from his campaign. Nice. Um, I wanted to touch on some fundraising numbers because the Brown campaign released some results, some uh, first quarter results. They raised more than $12 million, the campaign announced in the first quarter. Um, now, we have not heard from Marino yet on what they raised in the first quarter, but that's pretty regular. Um, he's really, as he just won his primary, so he's, it's going to take a while to get those numbers and know what they're going to be and what they're going to mean. But we do have what they had in the bank beforehand. And prior to the primary, Brown's campaign reported having $13.5 million in the bank. That's according to pre again, that's pre-primary, and uh, Moreno had 2.39 million cash on hand, again, prior to the primary. Who knows how much uh, money has rolled in since he locked down the nomination, but we do know that that's where Brown stands. Now, you might say, is that a lot? Is that, I don't even know, is that a lot? It sounds like a lot, so I thought I'd give you a little bit of perspective, just so you know, um, so you, is, you can see where we stand across the country. Here's another competitive Senate race, um, Arizona and that's where the U.S. Representative Ruben Gallego announced that he raised, let's see, what did he raise? Okay, 7.5 million in contributions in his first quarter. Okay. So that's another competitive race, mm -hmm. so you would, uh, where you would think that that would be somewhat comparable. And then one more, here's a Republican from Pennsylvania, he's Dave McCormick, who's challenging Senator Bob Casey, he's a sitting senator there, and he raised 6.2 million in his first quarter. And those are both, both, both of those, they were trumpeting that and saying how these are really high numbers, so, when if Jared Brown's numbers really are over 12 million, then that's pretty impressive for this point in the race. Yeah, I had seen what I'd seen in the campaign literature that had been coming into my inbox from the Marino campaign is, you know, of course they're asking people for mm -hmm. donations, but they're saying Sherrod Brown has raised this much money, so his campaign is aware is talking about how much money Sherrod Brown has raised as well. That. Um, I mentioned Dave McCormick, the Republican in Pennsylvania. He raised 6.2 million, but one million of that was his own money, and that's nothing wrong. That's how that's how the system works. Moreno is not afraid to do that either, and that's going to be that could be a factor because it's going to be a high spending race, and he's got the money to back it up. He did in his primary campaign. He he did spend self fund quite a bit, as did Senator er, Matt Dolan. All right, let's talk more about the Moreno campaign now. So, um, as we said, you know, not a lot of information on what's been going on there this week. I did reach out to his camp to kind of find out what was going on there, but didn't hear back in time for this show. But as we kind of mentioned, there seems to be a fundraising focus this week. A lot of campaign fundraising emails have been coming into the inbox. They did also um, get a, an endorsement from an organization called the Libre Initiative Action, which is a pro-Hispanic interest group. They are endorsing Bernie Moreno. Uh, here's a quote from them. Ohio's growing Latino community knows that the Buckeye State is a great place to live, raise a family, and start a business, said Lair Marquin Markham, advisor in the Libre Initiative Action Ohio. Unfortunately, Washington policies are making it increasingly difficult for Ohio Latinos to live out their version of the American dream. So that is uh, the opinion of that particular group. But it should be noted though that, that though that is a pro-Hispanic interest group, it is uh, funded by Republican mega donor Charles Koch, and you might be familiar with him. He's a conservative mega donor. Uh, he is ranked to the 23rd richest man in the world. So, doesn't make that endorsement any. I mean, you need perspective for these endorsements. Is what I'm trying to say. That's a lot of money. The man's got a lot of money. That is a lot of money. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. All right, we do want to share with you a fact check. We did notice that Bernie Marino had posted this tweet which we'll show you on your screen there. And that tweet includes some claims that have been debunked. I'll go ahead and read it. It's a national disgrace that Biden disrespects Christians by banning religious symbols at the White House and declaring Easter Sunday to be a national trans visibility day. While Biden slaps Christians in the face, Sherrod Brown is silent out of fear of offending the radical trans lobby. Are so, you, do you know anyone personally in the radical trans lobby? I don't. I do not. I don't either yet. I feel kind of out of out of the loop. I didn't even know that they were out there. <laughs> but okay, so we have two uh, assertions in there, mm -hmm. both that a lot of people are making, not just uh, the uh, not just Mr. Moreno, but both of which have been debunked. Why yeah, and I do want to actually just check because I did tweet or I did text his campaign. I want to make sure I didn't get anything sure. in from them. I did not because I did ask why this tweet was still up when mm -hmm. the claims have been debunked. Okay, you, no you checked that. No response from the okay. campaign. 
Um, well, well, let's explain the two. Um, sure. So the two claims in there, the first of which was that President Joe Biden had banned religious symbols from the White House on and Easter. On Easter eggs, specifically for the famous White House Easter egg roll thing that people go to, mm -hmm. uh, which it turns out he did not do that. That happened 40 years ago. Is mm -hmm. that right? Yeah. That, w that happened 40 years ago. So that's been, and all the administrations have been following that same uh, process. And, and so there's nothing new there. Nothing new there. And then the second claim there was that the Biden administration had made Easter Transgender Day of Visibility. And that is not true. Transgender Day of Visibility has been March 31st since 2009. That was when it was first declared that at the national level. And it just so happens that Easter fell this year on March 31st. He acknowledged it uh, each year he's been in office, but it just hasn't lined up with Easter, so it didn't get as much attention. So he did not declare, uh, he's, he's not, he did not declare Easter Transgender Day just to make everyone mad. <laughs> it did not happen. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. Uh, the other claim that was in that tweet, by the way, about Sherrod Brown's silence on the issue and, uh, and a motivation for that, obviously we can't know what's in Sherrod Brown's head. So We can't. We have no I idea. don't know what's in Sherrod Brown's head. No, I'd like to. I'd like to know what's in Marino's head, I'd too. I'd like to know what's in both of their if heads. If I could have a superpower, mm -hmm. it might be reading people's minds. Hmm. That's a horrifying thought. <laughs> horrifying. Doesn't that sound like fun? Mm. No thanks. <laughs> Okay, uh, the main topic for today is the school voucher program here in Ohio. So we kind of want to give you like a, a rundown of what it is. You may have heard the term Ed Choice voucher program. You may have heard the term Ed Choice expansion. So we want to give you a little bit of an overview over what this is exactly. Please, I'm listening. All right, so we'll just start with the fact that this is something that happened that passed in Ohio's budget. This was part of Ohio's budget. This wasn't a separate bill that passed. Not something that we voted for as citizens. This was passed in the budget, that's yes, right. Yes, the Ohio legislature passed this in the budget. And what it does is it changes who can get private school vouchers. And we hear private school vouchers. It's just this term that kind of gets thrown around. They're scholarships. They're scholarships from the state funded with taxpayer money. So it's a discount on whatever you would pay. And it goes directly to the private school for in the form of these scholarships. So. Here's something I want to point out about this. Now, in theory, it's supposed to be helpful because you're supposed to help impoverished kids who might be in bad school systems or failing school systems to go to a, a school that could help them uh, get a better, better education, and which is a nice thought for everybody, right? Yes. Right. It's something that was brought up when the Ed Choice Voucher Program first became available. It's something that was brought up again with this expansion. Now, of course, the issue with this is for, every, for when money goes to uh, the, the voucher program, it's going to come out of public schools. That, there's only so much education budget to go, go wrong. Well, there is a question about whether this does actually take money away from public school funding dollar for dollar. We get into that in our conversations that we have with Good. The experts thank in you a bit. For, thank you for fact checking me in real time to keep us street legal. <laughs> Ohio has issues and we are here to talk about it. Ohio now, has issues, has issues. <laughs> what good show does mm -hmm. it, right? Okay, here is what we need to know about this. Previously, the people who could get these private school vouchers, it was dependent on your income. There was a cutoff, an absolute maximum, where if a family household made X amount of dollars, mm -hmm. you couldn't get one of these vouchers, even if your kids were in private school. Right. So I emailed back and forth, actually, with the Ohio Department of Education today because I wanted to make sure we got this 100% right. That's good. Here's what I learned. In order to be eligible for this voucher, first you have to apply to a private school, mm -hmm. and you have to get accepted. Okay. So that's the first barrier to entry here you have to get accepted to a private school. Okay, may I ask, what if you are already enrolled in a private school? Then you've been accepted, and yes. Then you have been accepted, okay. Then you are eligible. Okay, which from comes there, into play later. From there, everyone accepted to private school that goes to private school can get this voucher. Wow, that's a good deal. Period, that's yeah. it. There are no other provisos. If you're a child in private school, you can get an Ed Choice voucher now. Okay, but there are there is uh, a limit on as far as like you hit, if once you hit a certain income, then it roll or you could, you only get so much back, right? Is that how it works? Yes. So we have the chart actually. Oh, good. Let's, so let's let's show everything. that chart. So this is from oh, wow. the Ohio Department of Education. So also, I just want to share a quick statistic here while you're taking in this chart mm -hmm. and looking at it. And Everyone if you are listening chart. to us on a podcast platform, now would be a great time to click the link and go to the YouTube video. It's a great chart, guys. You're going to want to see it. <laughs> it's a good looking chart. So here's uh, some, t some statistics. We're going to share some details for you from privateschoolreview.com throughout the show. 
We talked about you have to be accepted into a private school to get one of these vouchers. Mm -hmm. The average acceptance rate is 89%. Pretty high. Minority enrollment is 24% when it comes to private schools here in the state of Ohio. Hmm. Now, when you're looking at this chart, what you see here is an income amount on the left and then a dollar amount for a voucher on the right. Everyone, regardless of your income amount, can get a voucher. At the bottom of the chart, you see the minimum amount that people can get. So if we're looking at grades K through 12, mm -hmm. the least amount that anyone can get, even if you are a billionaire in the state of Ohio, is $950 per student. So if you're a billionaire in the state of Ohio, you have a student enrolled in private school, you are eligible, and if you apply for it, you will get a $950 scholarship. You know, maybe there's some billionaires from out of state watching this right now, and they're hearing about this sweet deal. If they move to Ohio, they can get 950 bucks off their kid's education <laughs> at St. Ed's. That's not a bad deal. And it's not just one kid. I got clarity on this, too, because if you're a billionaire and you see you're eligible for $950 in vouchers, it's per student. So you're, if you're a billionaire oh, okay. with five kids, mm -hmm. you can get five $950 vouchers. Wow, that's, that's great. There, it's your lucky day, billionaires. No, <laughs> no there's obviously we're making a bit light of it, but there is, uh, there is. It's uh, it's nice that people can subsidize in some way and not have to pay for the whole thing. But uh, what what is that? Is that really that necessary for people making that kind of income level? Is that what we're here to figure out today? You know, it's part of the conversation. It's also it's also just to educate people about what is now available. So okay. part of the conversation is is this the right use mm -hmm. of money? You know, there's a whole debate about whether the tax dollar should follow the student right. or whether the tax dollar should be going to the educational institution. Mm -hmm. And that is a question there. So uh, also, so if you're looking at this chart, you can see that there are varying levels dependent on your percentage of income as it relates to the federal poverty line. So the maximum amount if you make zero dollars up to 450 percent of the federal poverty line is you can get for grades 9 through 12 8400 dollars for a student you can get for grades k through 8 about 6200 dollars mm -hmm. for a student so those are the maximum amounts of the scholarship that you can get if you're on the lower income level of the spectrum and this is household income too by the way so if there are two parents earning those numbers are brought together i think we can Here's an important, I think we can come back, right? Sure. Here's an important thing that I just pulled from the Ohio Capital Journal and something that I saw today that I, because I wanted to know how, it, how is this affecting, long term, how is, how is this affecting the school, the school budget? State handouts, uh, they say right here, let me, I'm trying to look at the year. Okay, in 2008, um, private education, uh, the, these giveaways to private education or vouchers for private education were about $69 million. That was 2008. Uh, it was over 360 million in 2019. So that's a 416% jump. That's pretty significant. And as you said earlier, I, we're looking to go over a billion, I believe, this year. Is mm -hmm. that right? And so, that is with all, so as we're about to sure. learn, there are multiple voucher programs. Yes, not just this one. Yes, and we are about to learn more about that in just a moment. Well, let's do it then. Let's, I say we learn it right now. I think we should too. Okay, let's do it. We're gonna hear. At long last, I'm here with Laura Hancock. She is an award-winning political reporter and all kinds of reporting for The Plain Dealer and Cleveland.com with a concentration in education, and that's what I'd like to speak with you about today. Laura, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for all of your work that you do. I already told you this, but I'll say it to people, too. I read all your stuff. You guys are great. Love your podcast. Thanks for, uh, And thanks for keeping my parents sane during these trying times. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> all right. Well, Laura, one particular thing that I wanted to talk to you today about was some writing that you had. Well, you've been covering this for a while now, but over the last month, it's gotten some interesting info on it, and that is the school voucher program here in Ohio, the private school voucher program. First of all, why don't you set the table by telling people the intention, ostensibly, of what the Ohio school voucher, private school voucher program is supposed to do. There are five voucher programs ranging from some to help with kids with special needs to um, ones that help families of all income levels. Recently, the legislature expanded the one for the income. It's called Ed Choice Expansion, and they made it so that at all income levels, you can make 350000 a year, and your kids will get at least a partial scholarship. Now, um, pros for school choice is exactly that, that the tax dollars follow the students, and every child is different in terms of what they need. Not all children succeed in the public schools. And this is a way to get children out of um, poor performing public schools, um, public schools that might be beset by violence, bullying, that kind of thing. And then um, other groups 
pro public school advocates say that vouchers are not good because it's taking there's not endless amounts of money to pay for private schools and public school systems and that in the long run public school systems are going to be hurt by this and the ohio state constitution says that the legislature needs to fund a public school system so the public school system should not be the one to suffer here so last june as you said they did expand the money allowed for one of, for one of these programs and that was uh, an amended substitute House Bill 33. DeWine signed it into, Governor DeWine signed it into law. And the House Republican leadership in their statement when they released it said, this program is designed to safeguard lower income families. That was part of it. Did it succeed in that task based on your reporting and research? I mean, when I looked into that, I was, um, the question I asked is, in particular, I looked at it statewide, but I looked at it in particular for all 31 public school districts in Cuyahoga County, and I looked at how many kids did they lose to private schools. And I found, interestingly, not that many. I mean, there were schools that went from, you know, 30 kids on this particular scholarship in private schools to over 300. Yet when you look at the loss in enrollment to the public school, it might have only been like 16 kids. And so what that indicates is families that were already in private schools they were just upper income families that are now eligible for a partial or full scholarship in other words some of the, this program which is ostensibly intended to help lower income people move into a better education uh, situation ended up largely subsidizing people who are already in private schools right so this if you're saying that this is about school choice those families made a choice to have their kids in these private schools a long time ago mm -hmm. Yeah, just here's some of the numbers that you had here. In Rocky River, the Ed Choice expansion scholarships were nearly 20 times higher on February 1st than last year. In Bay Village, they increased 17 times. West Lakes increased 14 times higher. And that's according to analysis by you guys at cleveland.com. Uh, that those places seem pretty well off and maybe like they might not need a big leg up with their with their kids' education. Correct. I mean, some of these school districts that we're talking about are among the best performing in the state. And so we're not talking about like rescuing kids from really poor performing school districts where there's um, not enough resources for them. These are kids who are already in if the worst came to worst and tomorrow they had to go to the public school. Generally speaking, these public schools are pretty excellent. Yes. Uh, by comparison, uh, in the Cleveland Metropolitan School District, the number of kids receiving Ed Choice expansion vouchers increased from nine, that's nine total, to 28 total this year. That's a very small number compared to a student population, as you say, of more than 32,000 kids. So why is that? What's the disconnect there? Why did everybody in the wealthy uh, west side suburbs figure this out, that this is going on, but somehow the people that it apparently was supposed to be helping the most did not? Well, Cleveland's an interesting situation because there is already a universal income scholarship in Cleveland. It's the state's oldest scholarship program. It's called the Cleveland Scholarship. It's been around since 96. So most of families who are in private schools who live within the boundaries of Cleveland School District, they're already using it through the other voucher program. That's why we didn't really see a sizable increase. You do wonder about you know the the um, Lorraine City, those kinds of places, East Cleveland, why they didn't increase. And again, it might just simply be that even with a scholarship of six, $6,000 for K through eight and 8,400 for nine through 12, even with that scholarship as you know generous as it is, when you have a school that's charging maybe like 12 or 15,000 a year, even with the scholarship, that is not you know, the, the families are gonna have to come up with quite a bit of money and that might not just not be realistic for some more middle class, in, middle class and lower income families. You actually cited an article from ProPublica that where they suggested that some of the Ohio schools are strongly encouraging parents to apply for vouchers. In other words, they're saying, hey, that money's out there. You can go go out and get it. So they're they're educating those people about it. Is this a matter of educating people who need it the most? And what are, are there any efforts being done to do that? I mean, according to the Ohio Department of Education and Workforce, and that's the K-12 agency in the state, the schools are not allowed to mandate that families take vouchers because some families, they want to send their kids, they want to do cho school choice, and they want to send their kids to a private school, but they still don't believe in taking away, you know, tax money that they think should be for public school kids. And so some families on principle refuse to take vouchers. And um, the state is saying that's totally allowed. A, a private school cannot force you to take a voucher. However, if you need financial aid at a school, I mean, you're expected to take the voucher before they're going to look into aid to help right. you. Um, 
Now they we have a who is actually making out in this deal. Whenever something like this goes down, you've got to say to yourself, who's benefiting the most from this, and who who stands to gain the most from the system as it is right now. I mean, you could say that the operators of the private schools are. However, you know, I don't think they're getting rich per se. They just might have more enrollment and just maybe a little bit more cushion. I don't know of any like private school teacher who's like getting rich. Right. <laughs> you know. I, like generally teachers don't and private school teachers often make less than public school teachers. This just might provide some more stability. And the, di the diocese, the Catholic Conference of Ohio told me that at least in the Columbus diocese, they said that they are looking at some rural areas and thinking about building schools out there now that there's this more constant flow of funding. And um, the, the Catholic Conference of Ohio told me that other dioceses may be looking at that as well. People overseeing this program have seen these numbers too. They can't be too pleased with it. Has there been much negative reaction to the fact that this is largely subsidizing seems uh, wealthy students? I mean, people who support traditional public schools, they're not really surprised. They say that this was inevitably going to happen, that this wasn't going to help the middle and lower income families, that this was going to help the middle and upper income families. Um, and then state legislators who support school choice, they've kind of been all over the map. I mean, at first they told me that they knew that this was going to support children already in private schools, but it was about school choice and the idea that the tax dollars should follow the students regardless of what kind of school, homeschool, private school, charter school, whatever. Um, then I, then some of those same lawmakers have been pretty defensive because I think the public is, um, as they start to get more aware of what's going on, I think they've gotten some questions. And so you're seeing, um, some lawmakers just, you know, say that what I've written is untrue or it's propaganda. However, I mean, the numbers don't lie and there's really not another explanation for why there are so many kids going, getting these scholarships now, but you're not seeing a mass exodus from the public school system. So that would indicate that they were already in the private school system. All right, Laura. Well, it's a super important story. It caught our attention. We think it's uh, we think your work's great, and we appreciate everything you're doing for us and everybody is doing at Cleveland.com. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Thanks, Laura Hancock. We'll be right back with more Ohio Has Issues. Welcome back to Ohio Has Issues, everybody. You, you saw our newsroom there. You see people eating and stuff at their desks. Isn't it exciting? This is that time in between the newscasts where people are like having their snack and bunch, like getting ready for the next show. Bunch of busy raccoons back there and you get to watch <laughs> it. That's just one of the bonuses of getting to hang out with us here on Ohio Has Issues at where we are talking about the Ohio Education Voucher Program and some pretty big numbers that have recently come out. And we got some statements from some people, isn't that right? We did, yes. So uh, first we're going to hear from Ohio State Senator Kent Smith. He's a Democrat. He did vote no <coughs> on the state budget that included Ed Choice expansion. So here's the quote from him. The expansion of school voucher eligibility is a taxpayer swindle that sends public dollars to pay for private and or religious instruction and it erodes the financial stability of Ohio public school funding and could explode future state budgets. One of the ways that the GOP hid the cost of the voucher expansion was including it in the budget and not as a standalone bill. This type of legislation needed a full vetting process, not as a budgetary footnote. Strong stance from Kent Smith and use the fun word swindle. Which is this a fun <laughs> word? Can we agree on that? It's a fun word. Even if we don't agree on everything politically, can we all agree swindle's a fun word? Yeah, I think yeah. that's fair. Now, who else do we hear from? Okay, we did also not hear uh -oh. from Ohio State Senator Sandra O'Brien. So I reached out to her. <clears throat> the reason I reached out to Senator O'Brien is because 
Something similar was introduced in the Ohio Senate in February 2023, which would have expanded access, got rid of that income requirement for the Ed Choice private school voucher program. Mm. She introduced that bill. Nothing happened with that, and then it did end up in the Ohio budget, which was voted on in the summer of 2023. So her office sent me this response. Senator O'Brien will not be commenting on this. And I do just want to note that Senator O'Brien did vote yes in June on the Ohio budget that included that expansion. Now, you also reached out to Senator Sherrod Brown, and we have not heard back from them yet. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they plan to get back to us or not, but if they do, we'll update you. Um, but we did. You also reached out to uh, Bernie Moreno's, and his campaign did get back, and they gave us this. This is their quote. <clears throat> Parents should be the decision makers in children's education choices. Programs like these increase flexibility and empower parents to send their kids to the school that is the best fit for them. I'm thrilled that our state is putting parents in charge of the kids' education. In the Senate, I will fight against the woke indoctrination in our schools and will do everything I can to keep parents as the sole decision makers for their kids' education. That's a, a major sort of topic of conversation on this is decision makers on children's education school choice as I said earlier that's kind of the buzzword that people who support these programs are using school choice I've heard that yep it's a popular phrase um, so what, who do we talk to next about this who can who can give us some more information about this? well let's just talk quickly about the choices that people are making when it comes to schools and then we'll move on to our next oh, you've interview got some guest. numbers for us yeah so we do have some more numbers that I want to share with for you from private so for the 2024 school year right now there are 1,237 private schools in Ohio. In contrast, there are 3,656 public schools. So you're looking at that, it's kind of like a 25%, 75% split, roughly, doing some quick math. Now, in private schools, there are 221,101 students in the state of Ohio. That's according to data compiled by privateschoolreview.com. That's a lot. That's a lot of students. So as we're kind of looking at the budgetary issues that were referenced there that Senator Kent Smith referenced as well and other people continue to reference, Laura Hancock has some great articles on it, so I encourage you to check that out on cleveland.com. 221,101 students, if they apply for that, will get an Ed Choice private school voucher. They will. Now, some of those people are already on vouchers. A lot of them probably are already on vouchers, but they all could. They could all get a minimum of $950 if their parents were the most wealthy. It's a whole lot of money. That's in grades 9 through 12, of mm -hmm. course. So, so not all of them because some of those are in K through 8 and then it's a lower number. But you get the point that I'm trying to make here. And um, compare that to the number of students in public school. It's about 1.7 million hmm. students in public school across the state of Ohio. So just wanted to share those numbers with you. And just to be clear, we ain't hating on private schools or anything like that. that that's your choice, and I think that's a good choice you have. I went to private schools, as a matter of fact. I'm uh, one of those. I went to private grade school and high school, St. Mary and Joseph, go Bulldogs. And then I went to, of course, back then it was like the late 80s, so it was probably like 80, $85 for the year. <laughs> uh, same with my high school. So it, it really has gone up considerably, but I'm sure a voucher program like this would have been very helpful to my folks back then. And so I'm not, there, there, is, there is a place for this to help people. It's just now we, we're getting some weird numbers and it's how much it's changing so quickly. Whenever something like that happens, then we just want to keep our eye on it. Dig into it and let you know what's happening mm -hmm. too. You know, a lot of people aren't even aware of this program. A lot of people who are in public school that might like to go to private school, a lot of people who are on that lower income level in those underserved populations may not be aware that this is available to them. Right. A lot of questions here. Also, a lot of questions about who makes up the difference if the voucher doesn't cover the whole cost of that education. That's actually one of the things that I talk about uh, with our next guest. Okay. So a little backstory here. I told you I was reaching out to the Ohio Department of Education and Workforce here. Uh, Senior Program Officer Colleen O'Grady is one of the people who kind of oversees this program mm. and carry, carries it out, makes sure you know things are running, how they're supposed to run, that, corner, that sort of thing, oversees the program. Uh, she declined our request for an interview, but her office did make a recommendation. They recommended that I reach out to School Choice Ohio's CEO, Eric Yitz Frank. Can you do that? Can you just pass the buck on a statement like that? Can you just be like, uh, no statement out of me, but I talked to my friend. Yeah, I guess you can, because right, they well, did. All right. We're letting the people know about it. You Why know, not? we did reach out to the office and declined the conversation. It's a pretty smooth move. So we move on to the next, and we talked to School Choice Ohio CEO, Eric Gitz Frank, who I will uh, tell you the explanation for the nickname on the back side of this. Let's hear from him now. Stay tuned.
All right, I'm here now with the CEO of School Choice Ohio, Eric Yitz Frank. Uh, Yitz, as you go by, thank you very much for being with us today here on Ohio Has Issues. Thanks for having me, Stephanie. And we are here to kind of talk about the Ed Choice Voucher Program in the state of Ohio. So first of all, I want to kind of bring up some reporting that we've been looking at. You know, earlier we talked with Laura Hancock. She's a Cleveland.com reporter who had put out some articles kind of looking at the analysis of how the expansion of the Ed Choice Voucher Program has really kind of resulted in being implemented here in the state of Ohio. So I want to ask you this first. With School Choice Ohio, what is your mission? So we work around the state of Ohio trying to empower families to find a school that best fits for them, um, whether that's using one of the state scholarship programs, Ed Choice being one of five, a charter school, a traditional public school in their district or outside of their district. And we try and work with the legislature to make sure that the state's policies enable that. Okay. So I'll ask you. First and foremost, then up front, how do you feel? How does your organization feel about the way the Ed Choice expansion has played out here in Ohio? So I think, you know, the state budget for your listeners, uh, the state passes lots of policies in this in the summer and school starts about seven weeks later. So I think the state did a lot of good in a very short period of time. I think long term success of this program, there's been uh, a lot of growth in the program. Um, but we're going to see over time exactly how it's implemented and what kind of opportunities that that creates for more families. Okay. And the name of your organization is School Choice Ohio. So when this got passed, this item that was added into the budget got passed and became sort of the lay of the land here in Ohio, part of the way it was discussed was to provide school choice. Do you believe that the way Ed Choice has now been implemented is providing more school choice? So the, the answer is yes, but I think that when, when, when we assess how these programs are working or not working, we don't necessarily judge it by how many students are using a voucher or how many students are leaving a public school. We fundamentally believe that school choice will can transform the educational landscape in Ohio because what it does is it puts parents and students at the center of our education process and empowers them regardless of what school they're attending. So we don't necessarily care as much about how many students are using a voucher and going somewhere else. It's more about making sure that parents are in the driver's seat and then letting schools, whether they're private schools or public schools or charter schools, compete for those parents. Okay, well, let me ask you this. So the way that we've seen this play out in the numbers as reported by cleveland.com is there were more vouchers made available. The eligibility rules changed. People who made greater incomes were able to access these vouchers that weren't previously able to access these vouchers. So the way the numbers played out, there didn't seem to be a large increase in different students enrolled in these private schools with access to these vouchers. So are you happy with that? Do you think that makes sense? Is that is that promoting school choice or is that just kind of giving a benefit to people who had already made a choice? Right, so I don't, you know, from looking at the data in those articles, I think it's a little bit hard to exactly draw that exact point because we don't have data on how many kids are coming in from kindergarten. We don't necessarily have data on uh, demographic shifts within the state? Are there more students in the total system or less? So it's like just a little bit hard to do that. But again, like I don't really look at it um, at one particular snapshot in time. I think whenever you look at any kind of government policy over a two month period or a six month period, there's always going to be things, hey, is this working well? Could it be done better? I think we're going to learn that over time and be able to react accordingly. The other thing is that, you know, in America, at least in the K 12 system, we don't means test it, right? We let, we pay for children no matter what their um, family income is or where they live to go to um, school for free, or at least on the taxpayer's dime. All this policy does is give them an additional option of where those dollars should go, not whether or not we should pay them. That's not something we've ever done in America. Mm, okay. Let me ask you this. Where does School Choice Ohio stand on the aspect of whether there should be an income requirement when it comes to receiving an Ed Choice voucher? We view income requirements as a barrier to low-income families. When you put a uh, an income limit on any kind of program, 
what it does, it actually makes it harder for the people that you're targeting to access it. A mom wants to go and find a better school for her children. We ask her, where's your birth certificate? We need your income tax returns. We need your pay stubs and all those types of things. Those are all barriers for low income people. And so I think that when you have a broader program, not only is it, it the right policy in our opinion, because we think it improves the overall system, but it actually makes it easier for lower income Americans to access. Is it also fair to say that it makes it easier for higher income individuals to access who really probably have access to those resources to prove that income? I think the answer is, of course, there can be uh, people with with greater means that can access that. But I don't know what's going on in their families. I don't know whether they could access those choices or not. Of course, at the very highest levels of income, those families have all kinds of options open to them um, throughout society, right? But I don't want to judge whether middle class families actually have enough money or not. I want them to decide that. And we're paying for their education anyways. I'd rather put them in charge of where their child goes. Do you think that there's been a significant or a sufficient, rather, I should say, effort being made in these lower income places in Ohio to make people aware of the vouchers? So our organization spends a lot of time and money making sure that we're talking to families there. Every year we talk to about 25 to 30,000 families. Um, we are actively involved in that now. And again, we aren't necessary. We don't push them to go to a private school using a voucher. We just try and find the best fit for their family. And every family is different. Um, so I think more can be done. In fact, I think that one of the uh, the the pluses of the expansion to larger numbers of families, whether they're low income or middle class or even or even above that, is that there's actually going to be greater awareness amongst those communities that this is an option available. When, when you have a niche program, it's harder for lower income families to know about it and access it. And I think this will actually help with that. We'll see how the, we'll see how the numbers end up looking this year and next year, and then we'll, we'll be able to um, adjust accordingly. And just to talk really specifically again about some of the numbers that were reported in the cleveland.com article, what do you make of the fact that lower income area schools like, for example, on the east side of Cleveland, some of those places saw maybe a decline of 16 or so in enrollment. So it doesn't seem like there was a big burst of people in these lower income places using the vouchers. So I actually think this is a really important thing for your viewers to know. Um, it's actually one of the few uh, disagreements I have with the article itself. Um, the Those low income areas have had a universal school choice for a long time. The city of Cleveland has had a universal voucher program for over 20 years. Um, I know that East Cleveland is mentioned in there. East Cleveland, because of its performance over the past several decades, has had universal um, ed choice for, uh, for a long, long time. So I suspect that almost every single student in that area was already eligible. And there's, a and there's quite a number of students that use that option. They weren't necessarily directly impacted by the expansion that occurred in this summer because they actually already had universal school choice. And here's a question that I actually have been wondering myself, and you may or may not know the answer to this, but I'm gonna ask you anyway. These vouchers, are they covering the full cost of tuition or is someone who gets one of these vouchers maybe at the lowest income level, do they still have to come up with money to send their student to a private school even with a voucher? So the, actually, so the state wisely, in my opinion, has a rule, and that is that the very lowest income families that use these scholarships, so um, right now that's set at 200% of the federal poverty level, uh, which is a pretty common number for a lot of uh, government programs for low income uh, families or students, um, the, the, as a condition of the school participating in the scholarship program, they must accept that scholarship as tuition in full. So regardless of what their full tuition amount is, whether it's 10,000 or 20,000 or eight or 9,000, whatever it is, whatever that voucher is, that covers their tuition. Now, families above that, they still would be responsible to cover the delta between the full tuition amount and what the voucher provides. In many cases, especially in the Cuyahoga County area, um, the I, I would say a majority of the, of the school's tuition is probably covered in full by the scholarship. But there are many schools that that is not the case. And this parent, again, if they're low income, they are not on the hook for anything. If they're above that, um, they would need to, they, they could be responsible for the difference between full tuition and the voucher amount. Remember, the voucher amount's not not 
it, it's it's significant, uh, and we're seeing it's significant amount because it because the schools are obviously um, welcoming these students, and there's quite a bit of growth. Um, but it it it's about sixty one hundred dollars or so, sixty one sixty seven K through eight. Uh, so that covers a lot of the tuition at many many private schools, very high end private schools. It doesn't come anywhere close, um, but it does enable those those schools to take students they wouldn't be able to and supplement it with scholarship funds and financial aid and open their doors to more and often a more uh, to more students often a more diverse uh, student body as well okay now the story is definitely not over when it comes to the way ed choice vouchers are being distributed now here in the state of ohio obviously i'm sure you're aware there's a lawsuit against this pending in the state of ohio do you have any thoughts on how this may play out? Or I guess I just want to ask you, are you in support at at School Choice Ohio of how things are happening now or kind of what do you see for the future? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the one of the, I guess, concerning things about the lawsuit is that um we, we don't we don't think that they're gonna win on the merits. Um, but one of the primary criticisms over the years about the the way the voucher programs worked is that they would be funded through school districts and that caused a lot of districts to say hey you're giving us money to fund these students but more is going out than is coming in and that's a problem for them and we agreed and that's why we supported several years ago a change in the budget that the state now directly pays for all school choice programs and charter schools as well directly from state funds so school districts are not impacted positively or negatively when a student that lives there uses a voucher. And so I think that was not the case for a long time. Um, and it, today, if the voucher program closed tomorrow, um, public schools would not get one penny more or one penny less in state funding. Um, and we have invested, the state has invested significant amounts of dollars into our traditional public schools. At the same time, we've also incre increased access to school choice. I think Ohio has proven that we can walk and chew gum at the same time and invest significantly in our traditional public schools and give more options to families. Talking about that bottom line there, how do you feel about this? There was a certain amount of money estimated in the budget for the Ed Choice program as it was expanded, and it has significantly surpassed that. So what does that mean for Ohio? Yeah, so so when when the state makes an estimate it's it's really just an estimate we always build in a buffer to make sure that we can account for increases in enrollment or decreases in enrollment the state funds education or the vast majority of education spending for all students from the same line so they might think they might say hey this particular program is going to cost us a little bit more a little bit less and other ones might run ahead or behind and there's always a little bit of a buffer I have never seen the state outside of the Great Recession in 2008 actually run out of money for their education funding, um, even if even if uh, Ed Choice um, estimates ran even if Ed Choice spending ran vastly ahead of estimates, we still are nowhere close to having a problem, and I don't anticipate having an issue like that ever in the future as well. Along those same lines, I do have one more question for you. So, in terms of the eligibility for this, there's no floor, obviously. There's no ceiling. Even you know people who are incredibly wealthy, I think, are if correct me if I'm wrong, can still get at least a portion of the value of a voucher. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So who's applying for this program that doesn't get it? Does more vouchers going to people who are already in private in private schools mean that there is a maximum amount of vouchers available, and it could potentially be less available for these lower income people? Well, the the way that the the legislature designed the program, that won't be the case. There's no cap. There's sufficient funding in there. Um, we can conjure all kinds of crazy scenarios where the sky could fall. Um, but uh, I think that the legislature and the gov and Governor DeWine crafted this pretty carefully to make sure it really impacts all students in Ohio in a positive way. Um, I wouldn't be concerned about that. I've never seen that happen. I don't anticipate it ever. But there really is no limit. Whoever applies could get something. Well, hypothetically, that is true. However, remember, we are paying for all these students in some way anyways. The question is where they're attending, right? If you live in, I live in Beachwood School District. It's a pretty affluent district. I have lots, I have friends that are very, very wealthy um, that send to our local public schools, which are excellent, by the way. You should all check them out. Um, but we don't charge them tuition. So the state and the taxpayer are funding these kids. It's really just a question of where they're going. 
And we believe that the parents should be able to choose that more than us telling them where they need to go. Okay. And just to hammer this home, really, just I want to get at the point of the reason I was asking this question is that these vouchers that are now being accessed by people who are already in private school, they're not going to prevent people who are not yet in private school, these lower income people from getting vouchers as well. Is that right? That's correct. That's correct. And and I think there are a number of policies that the legislature could do in the future that could actually um, improve and actually increase more opportunities for low income families. But we have not seen any low income families be turned away. Most of these schools are mission driven. They want to take as many students as they can serve as possible. Um, and again, and many of those schools are relatively low tuition. They are they are just trying to service their students and their families. Um, and the scholarship programs are a huge, um, a huge uh, have a huge impact on their ability to do so, and and changes the lives of many of those kids. Um, just bear with me as I'm kind of thinking through this as we're talking. I really appreciate the conversation. I guess the limit would then only be the enrollment. The limit would be the number of private schools, the access to those schools and their capacity for enrollment then. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so uh, obviously uh, schools do grow and we're hoping that as schools see, if schools do see growth from the program, that they're going to go and add more seats. And that's something we see. Schools shrink, schools grow, successful schools will grow and they'll be able to proactively plan and add capacity. Um, and frankly, if they are shrinking, that means parents don't want them and uh, they'll probably end up going away at some point. And I think that's true across the board. Okay. All right, I'm gonna ask you yet if you have anything else you'd like to share on this topic before I let you go. I think we covered a lot of ground and I uh, appreciate the opportunity. Okay, thank you very much for being with us here on Ohio Has Issues, we appreciate it. All right, thanks, Stephanie. All right, that was Yitz Frank, the CEO of School Choice Ohio. Thank you for the conversation, Yitz. And we've all been waiting. You promised us you would tell us where the name Yitz comes from. I did. So Yitz is his nickname. Mm. It is the Hebrew word for Isaac from the Bible. Mm. And Yitz is a rabbi. Nice. Yitz, that's a fun name. That's a fun word. Yeah. Uh, Yitz and swindle we've heard <laughs> today. Those are two great terms you've heard on Ohio Has Issues. That's right. We keep the vocabulary <clears throat> growing. All right. Well, we have another, I, you have some other great numbers for us here from privateschoolreview.com. This is talking about the average tuition at private schools. The average private school tuition is $7,359 for elementary schools, that is. Mm -hmm. And it is $10,939 for high schools. That is significant a lot more than 85 quite an upgrade from <laughs> uh saints mary and joseph school um that's that's a lot uh vouchers hurt ohio coalition oh that's who we're talking to next yes that is our next interview guest also i just want to make another comment about the cost of private school tuition in case you didn't catch it in the conversation there with uh school choice ohio ceo Yitz Frank. So he was saying that if you are at 200% of the poverty level or below and you get accepted, then that private mm -hmm. school has to just accept that maximum voucher level and then the rest of that tuition is just waived. Oh, yeah. But that's not the situation for everyone. So that's why it's relevant what the cost of those private schools is when it, we're talking about the private school voucher system here in Ohio. Can we all agree this is very complicated, a bit convoluted in some ways? And uh, there's probably a way to clean this up, I would imagine, but I don't know. So, well, so Along those lines, the convoluted nature of it has a lot of people upset. Hmm. So, so much so that they did file a lawsuit against the Ed Choice Voucher Program specifically. Oh, okay. So our next guest is the executive director of Vouchers Hurt Ohio Coalition. And what that is, that coalition, it's a, it's a group of public school districts that have come together to sue the state over what they call the unconstitutional and harmful private school voucher program. That's directly from their website defining what the group is. And you spoke with the executive director. I did. Okay, that is Bill Phyllis. Mm -hmm. And he is the executive director of the Coalition of Equity and Adequacy of School Funding as well. This guy's got a lot of hats. Let's hear from Bill. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much, Bill Phyllis, for being here, the executive director of Vouchers Hurt Ohio Coalition. And that's what we're here to talk about today, Bill. We are talking about the expansion of Ed Choice Vouchers here in the state of Ohio. So I'll ask you first and foremost, how does your organization, Vouchers Hurt Ohio Coalition, feel about that? Well, uh, I think what, what we've done in court uh, expresses our feelings and uh, January 4, 2022, uh, the Ohio Coalition for Equity and Adequacy of School Funding slash 
vouchers hurt Ohio filed suit in the Franklin County Court. We believe that the uh, Ed Choice voucher program is uh, patently unconstitutional. It uh, flies in the face of uh, several provisions of the Ohio Constitution. Uh, uh, the Article 6, Section 2, uh, the state the legislature is responsible to secure a thorough and efficient system of common schools throughout the state. And they do that by taxation. That's the only place in the, in the, um, the entire Constitution that the state is uh, mandated by taxation to provide for anything. Uh, there's, a, there's an explicit command in the Constitution for the General Assembly to provide for a, and secure a thorough and efficient system of common schools throughout the state. That, that leaves out alternatives such as charter schools or vouchers or any other alternative. Um, and the fact that uh, uh, this state uh, had, uh, had a ruling against it in 1997 in the DeRolf school funding decision uh, and they haven't uh, provided for a constitutional system, um, you know, here in 26 years later, we still don't have a constitutional system. Uh, and yet millions and millions of dollars are being siphoned off of the, of the budget, the state budget, to provide for direct payments to private schools. And of course, um, the, the Ed Choice Voucher Program as well as as well as other voucher programs. Now, I want to clarify that we are only challenging the Ed Choice voucher program. Okay, is it your contention just in general that vouchers even beyond, I know the Ed Choice program is the only one involved in the lawsuit, but that the other voucher programs are also not something that are good for Ohio? Well, we're, we're not taking a position on the other ones. Just frankly, it's the Ed Choice voucher program that started out Actually, that this whole voucher idea started out uh, with the Cleveland school system back during the George Voinovich uh, uh, governorship, um, and it has been going from a, you know, has gone from a small program funded by the city of Cleveland school district to a billion-dollar program uh, that's, um, you know, you know, originally the. Um, uh, promoters of vouchers, the voucher advocates, the voucher zealots, uh, started out by saying, well, we want to rescue poor kids from uh, schools like in, in, the, in those years, back in the early 90s, uh, we want to rescue poor kids from uh, low-performing school districts. Uh, and, and they, you know, in, in, in very, you know, sympathetic tones, they would say, you know, we, we, we really need to rescue these, these children from a, a bad school system. Well, you, you know, that was, a, that was an idea to get their foot in the door on this voucher, uh, uh, this voucher scheme. Uh, all along, uh, they weren't particularly interested in poor kids. They were interested in uh, a kind of a public relations effort to get people to be sympathetic to, you know, a, a voucher scheme. And, 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 and so they've uh, now in um, 2023, 2024, uh, they, they have abandoned this idea of rescuing poor kids. Uh, they're providing Ed Choice vouchers to everyone in Ohio. Uh, now, you know, a billionaire with children in school is eligible for a voucher. Now, how ludicrous is that? Um, and, 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 and really, uh, poor kids uh, can't, can't afford the difference between a voucher and, and the, the tuition cost of, of a private school, and in fact, many, if not most, private schools. And so uh, what we have here is, is uh, the, the poor families of the state subsidizing uh, vouchers for the affluent families, the, the families that can afford a, a private um, uh, tuition. Now, proponents of the Ed Choice voucher expansion have said that it doesn't take any money away from public school funding. It does, do you think that's accurate? And how do you feel about that? Well, I, I think that's ludicrous. Uh, uh, you know, 26 years after the Supreme Court ruled that the school funding system is um, unconstitutional, we still, we still don't have 
a constitutional system of education. And in the last general or the uh, the last state budget, in the last state budget, um, they they did not phase in a a program that uh, we refer to as the Cup Patterson Fair Funding Program. Uh, they didn't phase it in because uh, completely because um, they didn't have they indicated they didn't have the money to do so. Well, they had the money to take a billion dollars out of the uh, school district line items or the line item in the budget, uh, the basic aid line item that funds school districts. They had they could take a billion dollars out of that fund to um, uh, provide for vouchers. And, and uh, let's be clear, every dollar that goes out to a voucher is a dollar that a school district doesn't have to spend. And every dollar that goes out uh, to a voucher means that the public school retirement system, the state teacher retirement system, uh, ha has about 20 cents less per dollar to go into the retirement fund. I want to ask you this. In a previous conversation that I had with the CEO of School Choice Ohio, we had kind of arrived at the conclusion that ostensibly under this program, there's supposed to be no maximum. So even the richest, as you mentioned, even a billionaire can get a portion of a school voucher here. There's no floor, obviously. His contention was the way this is written, anyone who would seek a school voucher will be able to get one. So these school vouchers going to people who are already in private school won't prevent people who are in lower income, lower performing schools from getting school vouchers as well. It seemed that the, the capacity was only capped at the number of seats potentially available in private schools. So my question for you is this, do you think that this is a trend towards privatization of education, big picture? Let's be clear. The the motivation behind behind those persons that are you know pulling the voucher strings, those people like Betsy DeVos, former U.S. Secretary of Education, those people like the Koch family, the the Walton Family Foundation, the legislative um, uh, uh, the um, American Legislative Exchange Council, those people that are well funded, those institutions and persons that are well funded. Their goal is to completely privatize public education. Now, their goal is the same as the economist Milton Friedman back in the 1950s, when he recommended uh, that the government, um, the only role of government in education is to provide a voucher for each kid, so that they expend that voucher uh, at, at, a, um, at a private school. He said the government had no business uh, regulating education. Now, uh, of course, uh, in those years, in the 1950s, so uh, we had that uh, Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court decision in Brown versus Board of Education, uh, which um, re required that um, education be provided to minorities and majorities on the same terms. Now, um, it was during that era that the, some of the Southern states used that voucher idea, Milton Friedman's voucher idea, to escape integration. And so they, in, in one case, in, in one of the counties in Virginia, they closed down the public system and gave a voucher to each, each student. And of course, the, the minority students didn't have a school to go to. Um, so now Friedman, over the years, the, the economist is a, a libertarian, had, didn't believe the government had much of a role in anything. Um, he, he, he came to the conclusion uh, during um, the latter, you know, his um, latter years. In fact, speaking before the, um, the, pub, the um, American Legislative Exchange Council, they called that organization ALEC, he, he, he uh, opined that, you know, public education was a mistake and that parents really should be responsible for the education of their own kids. So, you know, the government has a big pool of money for public education, and that big pool of money attracts people with various um, uh, financial interests as well as ideological interest. So there's a pot of money there that everybody, you know, seems to be wanting. That, that pot of money originally, by constitution, was set aside for the 
um, education of all the children, of all the people. It was set aside for the public common school system. And, and, and that's what our constitution very clearly says, that the General Assembly shall, shall secure by taxation or otherwise a thorough and efficient system of common schools throughout the state. Now, private schools are not common schools. Um, private schools can eliminate anybody. They can exclude anyone. Um, you know, parents uh, really don't choose schools. Uh, uh, the, the private schools choose the students. Uh, the, and, and of course, some private schools by regulation won't take certain kinds of students. Um, they, they won't take behavioral problems. Uh, you know, there's just various uh, uh, ki kinds of um, uh, criteria that they use to uh, exclude people uh, from school. But the common school, the one that's authorized in the Constitution, uh, accepts everyone. Everybody, everybody's welcome in the, in the public system. And, and, and of course, that's a, a major difference between public and private. Um, that, you know, the, private, the privates go by their own rules. Uh, the public go by the public rule. The privates are, are not a, are not accountable to the public. The public schools are accountable to the public. Elected local leaders, the board of education members, operate the public system, um, and they do it in you know with the open records law. Um, everything is transparent. Uh, there's accountability to back to the public. In the private sector. We don't know what goes on with the, the money that, the, that goes into you know, the school by way of vouchers. We don't know what goes on with the money or where the money goes when private schools get um, non-public um, administrative cost reimbursement. You know, there's no public audit of that. Uh, there's no public, public board meetings. Uh, the public doesn't know, and but yet, yet the public is funding a system or a series of systems, uh, giving a, a blank check with, with no accountability back to it. Now that that would be like, you know, th this idea of a voucher, as you know, being a, a right, um, and and the, the voucher proponents will say, well, people have a right to choose. Well, you know, if I want to belong to a country club. Do I have a right or a voucher to pay, you know, take uh, take a voucher for out of the parks and recreation system uh, and to pay for my private membership in a in a private country club? Uh, if I don't want to swim in the public pool, should I get a voucher so I can build a, a pool in my backyard, you know, for my own family, for my own interest? Uh, this, this idea of, of um, a voucher for private choice, uh, it, it goes against all the principles of, of taxation. In fact, that's what a lot of these people want. They, they want they're like Milton Friedman ended up saying, uh, parents ought to pay for the education of their own kid. And so it's my opinion that once vouchers are kind of universal, then there will be those who say, well, let's just wean people off of vouchers and let them pay for the education of their own children. Okay. Now, Bill, what I'm hearing you say there is, yes, this does seem to be an end goal of privatization. I want to ask you one more thing here before I let you go about the lawsuit. The lawsuit was initially filed, as you mentioned, in January of 2022. Now, here we are in 2024. We're in a different landscape with the voucher system. So, is it your contention that it's not necessarily just the changes that happen, but it's the voucher system in general, the ed choice voucher system that should not exist because it's unconstitutional in Ohio? Our contention is that the ed choice voucher program violates several um, uh, sections of the Ohio Constitution. It, it violates the Article 6, Section 2, the Third and Efficient Clause of the, um, of the Ohio Constitution. It, it violates um, Section 1, Article 7 of the Constitution, which, uh, which states that no, no person shall be forced to pay, essentially, for the religion of other people. Um, now, 90% of the money going out to vouchers goes to religious schools. And so we have this, this issue of 
public money going to religious schools, no accountability, no public oversight, and yet the public is supposed to just give a blind check to these private institutions. And, and you know, that's, that's just wrong. Well, Bill, we very much appreciate your expertise and the historical issues that you've brought up on this topic and want to thank you for being with us here on Ohio Has Issues. Well, thank you. And you can call me anytime. Okay. Thank you, Bill. All right. Again, that was Bill Phyllis. He is the executive director of Vouchers Hurt Ohio. So again, very much against the voucher program. But as he made clear there, the lawsuit that his organization has filed, which has a November trial date, by the way, uh, it was filed in 2022, finally getting that trial date for November. It only deals with the Ed Choice vouchers. He gave you a number that we are still trying to confirm, and, I, and I, I'll get back to you once you tell him what that oh, is. Yeah, so as he said there at the end, if you heard him there, he said that 90% of voucher money goes to religious schools here in the state of Ohio. So Mike's kind of looking to see if we can confirm yep, or verify that number. trying to find someone number. more respectable than me to <laughs> confirm that. And uh, I will tell you this, though, from PrivateSchoolReview.com, they have listed from the data that they've collected that 69% of the private schools in the state of Ohio are religiously affiliated. They, stay, they say most commonly Catholic and Christian. So remember earlier we told you that there are about 1,200 private schools in the state of Ohio. That would mean about 850 of those are, in fact, religiously affiliated schools. All right. I'm sorry. Uh, we have to. We can't confirm that yet. You, look, he might be right, he might be wrong, but Ohio has issues, does not feel comfortable confirming quite yet. <laughs> there it is. We're not calling it. We're That's not the calling level of it professionalism at this time. we uh, offer you here. But like, like we said, we can tell you 69% of the schools, yes. according to Princeton, uh, privateschoolreview.com, are religiously affiliated big here number. in the state of Ohio. And so the religious affiliation there is a big part of the constitutional question about this voucher program here in the state of Ohio. So that brings us to our final guest for you of the show today. Yeah, who did I who, who was our final guest of the show? I forgot. That was the oh lovely my gosh. law professor. Thing. Law professor Daniel Jaffe. You were wonderful, Mr. Jaffe, and I appreciate it. This is, he's from Case Western, uh, Case Western Reserve University, and this guy knows his stuff. And if you want to get into the legal nitty gritty, mm -hmm. who do you talk to? You talk to Mr. Jaffe. Listen to him. I'm glad to be joined by Professor Daniel Jaffe of Case Western Reserve University, who has been teaching education law since 2006. Thank you for joining me, Professor. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me. Appreciate no problem. It. Um, I have a lot of questions for you about this, but first and foremost, is this a normal way to pass these in the budget? Is this a normal way to pass these sorts of laws, or do these normally start become laws through law, and or do they normally get passed in the budget like this? Um, it's not unusual to have an uh, item like this in the in the budget. The budget bill last year was a particularly large bill, um, several thousand pages long. Um, but since this is a budget item and it's about funding, uh, it's not something that's unusual for them to put it there. Uh, that said, uh, it, it, the the budget bill because it's required. Uh, every second year by June 30th, uh, it's commonly a place where things get shoved in at the last minute. And uh, last year's budget bill was no different. Now, are we alone, Ohio, in passing education reform like this through the budget, or is this normally done uh, through law and through passing it actually through the legislature? Is this something that happens just in Ohio, or is this many states do it this way? Uh, I can't really answer that. I, I don't know the process from state to state, and there's 50 of them out there. Uh, right. So I don't really have an answer for, for that question specifically. Uh, I can tell you that Ohio is one of 10 states that has a, a voucher program uh, at this time. So okay. um, there is a lawsuit pending now. Do you think that this can this is going to hold up in court the way that they passed this budget or the school funding reform? Well, there's a lawsuit now pending in the Franklin County Common Pleas Court, and that's scheduled to go to trial in November. Uh, where that one comes out in the Common Pleas Court, uh, I, I don't know. I think it has a chance, um, it, but it's certainly going to go up to the Ohio Supreme Court uh, for an ultimate decision. Uh, and by the time it gets there, uh, I guess it depends quite a bit on the composition of the Ohio Supreme Court at that time. So uh, 
you know, predictions are hard to make, especially about the future. So how about yeah, that? So it is all about timing. Do you think if it, based on what you know of the Ohio Supreme Court right now and how it's configured, do you think that if this were challenged in the current Ohio Supreme Court, it would hold up? Uh, my expectation is, is that yes, if it were to go today to the Ohio Supreme Court, I think it would uh, it would withstand challenge. So this is legal. What's uh, how they are how they've decided to adjust the funding, so that now we it's not so much it's less income based than it was before. Well, so here here's the thing. The, the, you know, obviously, uh, what what is legal and isn't legal. Uh, changes over time based on the decisions of the different courts. So there's two places that we have to look to, to figure that one out. One is to the U.S. Supreme Court and the U.S. Constitution uh, and whether it's legal under the Establishment Clause, uh, which generally separa separates uh, church and state. So that's, that's, that's one thing. And, and the answer there is, is pretty clear at this point. That um, that yes, you you can have vouchers, and yes, the money can go as long as it's I'll I'll call it washed, not laundered through individual choices. Then uh, it can go to religious schools. So that's the one constitutional question. But there's a separate question, which is a state law question, and that's why we expect this to end up at the Ohio Supreme Court. And that is in our state constitution, we have a requirement uh, right in the constitution for a thorough and efficient system of common schools throughout the state. Uh, and it also says that no religious or other sect shall ever have any exclusive right to or control of any part of the school funds of the state. So that that's the, the constitutional provision that uh, the Ohio courts are going to look at, and and that is uh, without regard to the U.S. Constitution and the Establishment Clause. Seems like there is a little bit of wiggle room to work around in there, and they find it when they can, as far as that language goes. Uh, well, the, I, you know, that language is uh, something that needs to be interpreted, and mm -hmm. uh, and the courts will do their job and and interpret that language based on the facts of this case, like they do. Well, thank you for helping interpret it for us a little bit, Professor. We appreciate your time. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Now, interestingly, the people who will be deciding on this issue uh, might not actually be currently the people who are now sitting on the Supreme Court because this is going to last for how long, do you think? Well, it's going to trial in November mm -hmm. and the election is in November. Yes. Yeah, so we, Ohio, is the only state this election with the opportunity to flip control of the Supreme Court based on justices who will be on the ballot. So they might, the, the Supreme Court that they are facing now might not be the Supreme Court that they'd be facing in November when it comes down to deciding on this issue. So that's something else to watch. Yeah, that is an interesting point based on what he said there about how his perception is, of course, you know, whatever happens at the county level, this will end up going up to the Ohio Supreme Court. And this particular court, he thinks, would uphold the voucher program. But who knows? Who knows what the court will look like? True. At that time. And, you know, that's just his opinion. What's yours? We'd like to know. Tell us in the comments. Or, <laughs> or don't. It's up to you guys. Depending on what the opinion is about. Yeah. I, no, I'd like to hear your opinions. Bring them all. Bring your opinions. His DMs are open. Yeah, let's do it. I, had, I think I had a good time here today. I did too. Yeah, I think uh, we got through a lot of stuff. So hopefully you are leaving a little more informed about this voucher program. I learned so much. Mm-hmm. I, I know. I watched. And so did I. I did too. I watched you learning, and we all learned from you. And thank you for all the work. Oh, of course. This was a um, this was a great idea for a show. Okay. I'm glad that we got to do it. Got to give uh, give it up to Beebs on the ones and twos, mm -hmm. our producer. Thank you, Beebs, and thank you for joining us on Ohio Has Issues. We'll see you back next week. Bye, guys.